And Jeffrey, I can't remember, are you the one with the good side splits or the good front splits? I think you're the good front splits guy, aren't you? Yeah, I'm still working on my on my side splits. That's kind of my last one I'm waiting to unlock. Um, I was a baseball player, so I've, I've dealt with a host of uh, hip rotation issues, and um, I think I finally figured out. Basically, I got down working with Emmett a little bit um, yeah. mm. to calves but I kept getting blocked up in my left hip. Like it just kept felt, feeling like my femur was just in my hip socket wasn't moving. So let, let me make a suggestion on that while we're, while we're waiting. Um, the secret to that, if you are getting that block hip sensation is uh, increase your external rotation and you'll probably need someone to help you to do that. But basically I've done this with literally thousands of people. You basically get into the side split position, but before you actually experience a stretch. So maybe you're a foot off the ground or something like that. And then the person who's helping you, they've got to be really strong in the hands too. It requires a lot of grip strength to do this. What they will do is they will rotate your leg inwards while you try to rotate it outwards. So it's an isometric mm -hmm. contraction. And you okay. basically do work against their strength. And when you have someone really holding, and they have to hold the whole bulk of your thigh and up re relatively close to the hip joint too, so that when they try and turn that hip outwards like this, you're, you're being blocked by them. And what that does, the, the, the whole compression and grip on the thigh, as well as working against their hand strength, that has a different effect than shifting mechanical weights or you know, doing something with body weight. And then when you try to externally rotate after the contraction is over, let yourself go as soft as you can. Supporting yourself on the elbows would be perfect with a chair, right. that, that's how I did it. And then what you do is you, you externally rotate the thigh further yourself, and then you ask them to give you a bit of extra assistance, and then they twist it the other way, and you'll get an extra few degrees. When you do this a few times, you'll find that the, what'll happen is the, um, the greater trochanter, that bump in the in the thigh bone, will actually clear the um, ischial, the, not the ischial tuberosities, the uh, ilia themselves. Oh. You'll, and it's not just, I mean, there's plenty of space there. There's a good inch or so of space there. But the fact is, there's tissues in between. There's all right. The, well, they're the ones that need to be convinced to get out of the way. And look, when we when we talk later on, if, if I don't remember to to mention this, please ask me about this. But the real reason why um, decreasing your muscle tonus is so important um, to becoming more flexible is actually about letting tissues that have to move out of the way move out of the way without any force. So look, ask me about that. It, it's a completely counterintuitive thing, um, especially in our culture and especially working with athletes and being an athlete yourself or an ex-athlete perhaps. Um, where the buff body is celebrated. The buff body is something where we're actually holding tension and, you know, looking a yeah. certain way. But in fact, if you want to sit in full lotus, for example, and, and one of the teachers I work with, um, he was six foot three and he weighed 240 pounds and he had absolutely massive thighs. I mean, massive thighs. And he could flip himself up into full lotus without using his hands. Now, I've never been that flexible, but the thing is, when he put one leg up on his thigh, um, the thigh literally smooshed out of the way. That's how soft he was. It literally wow. moved out of the way. And so if you think about um, folding up a skeleton in full lotus, there's no drama to that at all, right? Because the right. bones are resting on each other. That's the, that's the kind of uh, mental image we need to have because when you do get flexible enough, and I demonstrate this on workshops all the time, your muscles do flow out of the way. And this is the big thing for athletes, that does not mean that you can't generate force. But we'll, anyway, we'll talk about all of these things. Yeah, I can't wait because that's, you know, I've followed your stuff now for probably about six or seven years. Um, I know. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I, when you, when yeah, you said that, I was so excited. A, it's been a while. Um, you know, I first heard about you um, through gymnastic bodies. And then of uh, once, once everyone muddied their way out of the drama there, um, <laughs> You know, I followed you on on the um, the the cat. Which one is it? The forum that you have, the cat like movement. Is it cat like movement? Uh, something ha is or happening. Stretch therapy. Uh, well, stretch therapy. Well, let's see. The stretch therapy community forums is our forums. We have stretchtherapy.net, which and we have the Instagram account, which used to be called cat like movement. Look, it's it's complicated. Here we go. Lucas is appearing. 
I see a little a little sign saying Lucas, and I see a face. Ta da! <laughs> oh, how exciting! All right, Lucas, adjust your picture, please. You're cutting your head off at forehead height, and that's doing you a grave disservice. Oh, look at that! That's beautiful. And Lucas, you look as though you're in a pretty big room too, are you? Yeah, I mean, I'm in the the uh, spare bedroom. It's the kids' playroom. It's the oh, quietest, oh, quietest room this time of day for us. So. Now, notice I'll just I'll just make a little technical note here because Zoom and Skype both claim to be full duplex systems, right? Just like the cell phones that we use every day are, but they're not. If you say something, Lucas, listen to what happens to my voice. I'll keep talking and you say something, say something, say something. Um, Lucas, say something good? there. And he, he would, he would yeah. oh, as, soon yeah. as, you, yeah. as soon as you talk, it cuts off my voice. That's a half duplex system, like using a, uh, you know, a walkie talkie. Right. And so we both have to, or we all three have to be very careful, I think, about interrupting each other. So if I can suggest a convention, we could just try it out. If you want to interrupt me, Jeffrey, just hold up your finger like this. That's it. And now you talk. I don't know whether that's a bit artificial or not, but I did, I did listen uh, to the Emmett, I, I did listen to the Emmett podcast very closely. And, you know, someone that records broadcast standard sound and the things that we do, I noticed straight away that... <laughs> it's like so many things in American business, they will tell you one thing and the reality is actually something different. The reason I suggested those small changes, Luke, is to the way the sound is set up, the disabling the um, suppressed background noise or suppress intermittent noise is those systems are too strong in Zoom. And what happens is when you start to talk, it, it, in the instant of you starting to talk, it interprets that as um, a background sound and squashes you. And it's only when the system switches over to you that it thinks, oh, okay, it's actually, that's what we want. But anyway, look, we are recording according to me. Are you recording, Lucas? Yeah, I still am trying to uh, look at that uh, suppressed persistent recommendation you gave there. So I'm just, okay. I'm just in the audio. Off. All right. Okay. We'll just d disable that and see how that works. Um, and I think if we're just patient with each other and if we can hear in our return feed whether or not the audio from the other person has been disturbed at all, we can just say the question again if it's not clear. I mean, one of the things that we love to do in our work is we love to record live. No editing. If, it, if someone fucks up and makes a mistake, so what? You know, it, it, it adds, in my opinion, to the the immediacy of, of watching and listening to a program. Oh, I can see you. So the oh, your you? video is still feeding and I can see Jeffrey. Um, okay. his, his video is still feeding. But it just goes to show, doesn't it? I mean, this is the latest and best technology. We're all using the latest version. We're all using good equipment and we're all on a decent internet connection. And still, it's not problem free, is it? Yeah. No, right. okay. Yeah. Well, look, if you want to start recording, Lucas, um, or, or Jeffrey, I think, Lucas, you're hosting it, aren't you, technically? Yeah, I, I'm going to uh, facilitate our conversation and, and keep us on track. Okay. Go you know, with some of those questions that uh, I had sent you, so. Yes, and look, I've got something else I want to talk to you about as well, um, and okay. this is partic particularly important for your athletes. Um, and I, I personally don't like working with team sport athletes because... It's a, they're, it's a very blokey atmosphere and you feel like smacking them in the head, but many of them are just too big to do that. And uh, so you have to sort of go with that whole team vibe thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I, I'm ready. Okay, so I'll get started with a little introduction. Here, so, hey, so welcome to Range of Strength podcast. We have a very special guest with us here today. Uh, Jeffrey and I are very excited about this. Um, he has had a massive, massive impact on our journeys into flexibility and strength training and just all around um, our lives in the last few years. Um, look, this gentleman comes from both sides of the coin. And that's, you know, one of the things Jeffrey and I talk a lot about is, you know, the ability to move from one spectrum to the other and, and be able to share those insights as well. Mm. He's a scholar and an educator. Um, and he's had a huge impact on many people's lives all over the world. Kit Laughlin, thank you for uh, for joining us. Uh, I, look, look, I'm extremely grateful, and and I do see myself 
as an educator, I've, and thanks for, for mentioning that. And as an educator and a presenter, um, well, you both know this yourselves, all we want is we simply want a receptive audience. And when I say receptive, I don't mean uh, guru to student type receptive, that kind of passive receptivity. I mean people with whom you can have a decent conversation, with whom you can argue with and and say whatever you want to say from the heart. And if And if someone can explain or show you a different or better way of thinking about it that's more useful to you, you have to be flexible enough inside to say, God, I've never thought about that before. That's, that's really good. I'm going to take that on and go with that. And because if you can do that, if you can leave ego and identity and all those kinds of things at the front door, which is what we always say in our workshops, then you really have the chance to learn something. And the chances are it will be something that you cannot anticipate before it's being learned. You just can't imagine it. Yes, and I think that's, you know, one of the reasons, in my opinion, like why you were able to um, do a lot of the things that you've done, right, is, is to have those perspectives and that open mind um, application from, you know, and, and also putting yourself in those situations. Um, if you, you know, read your story, where you came from, that's actually where we would like to kind of kick this off for our listeners. Um, you know, our, our listeners... Uh, are probably half and half very new to flexibility and mm -hmm. strength training and trying to really figure this thing out and then the other half are very passionate about it just like we are and they know kind of those things so if we could um kit if we could go in, sure. into your story and well look before before we go into my story it's such a such an extraordinary thing to be asked if you think about it um, I, pr I probably know more about strength training than flexibility training. And it sounds a, it's probably a big call um, to say that. Uh, but I've had a very interesting background in strength training. But, but because there are so many people in our field, our collective field, the strength training flexibility field, let's call it, there are so many people who are out there doing things in that field. Olivia and I, about six or seven or eight years ago, decided that we would concentrate only on the flexibility end of our spectrum. And so publicly, that's what we've been pushing. But privately, well, Olivia, she's an ex-gymnast and me, um, I've been, I was a middle distance runner at one point in my life. At, and I say reasonably competitive at a state level, which would be similar to being reasonably competitive at a state level in one of your states. <clears throat> so, not, so not genetically gifted, but a very hard worker. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But at another time in my life, I did Olympic lifting as seriously as I could. And I have one or two very modest personal bests. But until you actually see my body, of course, you, it's hard to, to, to understand this. But my body is not an ideal type for Olympic lifting or powerlifting. Um, it's probably a better body type for running, middle distance running. But even so, and this is where so many of the armchair coaches just, I have to say, they just press, press my button because as far as I'm concerned, unless you have actually struggled with the ups and downs of trying to become stronger or the ups and downs of trying to become more flexible or the ups and downs of trying to acquire a skill that you don't have, in my opinion, you just don't have the right to pronounce on any of these things. So way too many people in our field are what I call armchair coaches. They read everything, they, they, can, they can argue well, but actually their own backgrounds, they don't have any what I call deep personal experience or, and, and, what, and what some other writers call skin in the game, which I think is a big part of baseball. They talk about skin in the game, don't they? Um, and it has many meanings, but, the, but what I'm talking about is actual personal commitment. This is incredibly important, but if you ask me about my personal story, so let me just give you a quick, a quick sketch of it. When I was about 18 or 19, I was running with a pretty bad crowd and I got pulled over. I, was, I, was, I had one of the, well, I don't know whether either of you understand anything about motorcycles, but I had one of the first K1750 Hondas in Australia. So I was 18 or 19, I think it was the first four cylinder 750, the first bike with a disc brake, very powerful for its era and just a wonderful thing. And it was, it was my entire life. 
Anyway, I was pulled over four times in one week by this same sergeant of police. And the, and the third time I said, come on, what, what are you doing here? And he said to me, look, I've been keeping an eye on you. He said, I keep an eye on all the, the kids around here. He said, the crowd that you're running with is not a good crowd. And he said, if you, and he said I'm checking your bike for stolen parts. He said, I know there are no stolen parts on this bike. It's brand new. But he said, I'm harassing you. Well, he didn't use the word harassing. He said, I'm putting pressure on you because I, I think it would be very useful for you, for you if you changed the path that you're actually on. And look, no one in my entire life, apart from my father, had ever said anything like that to me. And so that was the end of that interaction. But a few months later, a friend of mine, I noticed that he was, he was developing, you know, some serious biceps. I, I said to him, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm, going, I'm going to what we call in Australia the Police Citizens Boys Club, it was called then. It's called the Police Citizens Youth Club now. And it was like, I, I think there's a similar facility in the States, but I'm not completely certain about this. But basically, it's a, something that was run by the police, which used to host things like wrestling, um, Olympic lifting, bodybuilding, powerlifting, and a bunch of other things, all in the one facility, a very, very good facility as it happened. And one day I was, I'd, so I'd gone to join my friend, <clears throat> James, his name was, he's dead now, but that's another story. So I was, we were bench pressing that particular day. And I'm, I put my hands up to take the bar off the rack and I, I looked up and there was this guy, the same cop standing over me. I thought, holy shit, what's going on here? And, I, and so I, I stopped and said, I said, what's the story? And he said, well, actually, I run this place. And he was a, a champion, ex-champion rower. Um, and he said, if I can help you with any of your um, bodybuilding or weightlifting or whatever, he said, just ask. And I did, in fact, do some wrestling with him. And I did, uh, certainly he was there all the time for talking to about training. And he was an ex-athlete himself. So again, a very practical person to speak to. And that was my beginning. That experience of getting stronger and completely changing the appearance and function of my body, it's, it changed my life. And I suddenly experienced the excitement of, well, the, the, the feminists have made this word uh, popular these days, but empowerment at, at the most basic level. And I know you both understand completely what I mean. When you actually start to feel strong and start to feel a bit more in control of your life, in control of yourself and hence a bit more in control of your life it's a, it's an exhilarating experience isn't it so that was that that was my beginning if you like in the whole strength training journey <clears throat> and even when i was a middle distance runner i still kept some strength training up and that was what when i was a middle distance runner that's why i was a very i think why i was a good finisher even though my coach, I'm jumping forward a few years now, my coach used to tell me that I was a lazy trainer. Uh, he said, I just don't understand your numbers. He said, you've got this capacity, but I, I see from your training diary that you, when you run your 10Ks and, or in some time we were doing in the winter season for middle distance running, then it was popular to run, if you can believe this, 100 miles a week. So that's 160 kilometers a week for three months of the year. It was a serious commitment, you know, and massive stress on the body too, but that's a whole other story. But what he couldn't understand was I just didn't find training, running training in enjoyable in the way that strength training is enjoyable. Strength training allows you to literally commit 100% of your intensity to a set. And it's over in 30 seconds. <clears throat> Middle distance running is nothing like that. It's like swimming training. You literally, on, as a swimmer, you're literally watching the line on the bottom of the pool. You go swim up, you tumble turn, you swim back, and you repeat that 50, 100 times in a session. Nothing else is ever going to happen. All you can ever do is work on the smoothness, the symmetry, the, the softness of your movements. And it's the same with running. When you, when you run miles and miles and miles, you, you are simply concentrating on, well, in my case, trying to relax more because I was a very tense runner. And that's part of the story we'll tell later because it was actually tension that stopped me being a really good runner rather than an average runner. And when I say tension, I mean in the finishing stretches of my 800 or 1500 meter races, I used to tighten up in between my shoulder blades and that tension was so extreme it would actually reduce my 
arm movement slightly and that reduced my stride length and so I'd be pushing as hard as I could to try and finish and I certainly had the strength to finish but I would be actually fighting myself and you know what it's like when you see a great athlete running Ben Johnson is still my favorite sprinter um, even though his name completely unfairly in my view was tainted with steroid use and all the rest of it I mean they were all doing steroids as you know the subsequent re research and publicity has shown so Ben if you look there's that famous photograph of Ben Johnson I think he's on the right hand side of the screen from memory and he's off the ground so and he was this was the he had actually crossed the finish line but his body is completely smooth and Carl Lewis behind him, and I think Carl Lewis is about two, two yards behind him at this point. And even though the focus of the image was on Ben, Ben's skin and musculature was completely relaxed. Carl Lewis, even though the image is out of focus, you can see that he's literally straining every muscle. Every fiber is visible. Ben had mastered the art of moving quickly in a complete state of relaxation. And his, his coach, you know, his coach, Charlie Francis, he was so big on that. Um, and the other guys, they could not run as well as he could. He looked like an animal running in the best possible sense or like a cat, my favorite animal. You know what I'm mean, talking about, don't you? When you yeah. watch a great athlete moving, in fact, I'll take a step back and say as a consultant working with many elite athletes over the years, the first thing that I used to do when I lived in a different city is I would... I was always working with running based athletes. I would take an athlete out into the paddock. There was a, a big oval next to my house and I would have a pair of binoculars and I would simply say to this person, male or female, I'd say, look, could you just start up there, run across my field of view, left to right, run back the other way, then run away from me, then run towards me. And then let's talk about the problems that you're having in running. And if you have the eye, by the time someone has run backwards and forwards or towards you and away from you, you can see exactly what's not working, what's not smooth, what's not fluid, what's not cat-like in their movement. And then working in my field, I would say, okay, well, look, in my opinion, your glutes are inactive and the likely reason for your glutes being inactive is because your hip flexors are desperately tight. The reciprocal inhibition reflex, as you both know, will turn off your glutes in a heartbeat. As soon as the hip flexor experiences a stretch, and it's always rectus femoris for runners, as soon as rectus femoris experiences a stretch, the brain switches off the glutes. And so you might be at that point where the body is trying to push off, trying to extend the hip joint via the glutes, but simply can't do it. And so here's a story that illustrates what I'm talking about perfectly. I remember working with this um, Olympian female sprinter and we had just the one consult, the oval consult, and two days later I met her at a gym. She was in Canberra because that's where the Institute of Sport is, and so all the runners from around Australia would come for their summer camps to this one place. So the analysis was simply looking at how she ran and looking at her body confirmation and the huge development of her hamstrings and the underdevelopment of her glutes, which is quite unusual for a runner, but that's what she was displaying. And we did, a, we did two strong hip flexor stretches. Um, I helped her and she got a considerable increase in movement and we did two glute activation exercises in the gym situation. And then she went back home and about, I would, have, I would say, she did a running session on the Friday and she called me on the weekend, it would have been on Sunday, so two days later, and I, and I picked up the phone and I heard this little excited voice, kid, kid, kid. And I said, yeah, what's the matter? And she said, my glutes are sore. I, I said, well, d wouldn't you expect them to be sore? And she said, she was all, I won't say which country she come from, but she was her national champion, 100 meter sprinter at the age of 14 years. And she had never had sore glutes following a training session. And I'm not making this up. You couldn't make this stuff up. And she ran her personal best 100 metre time, even though she was at the end of her career as a result of that. And that, that's a true story. So, so it's just a matter, isn't it? And you, as both of you are coaches, you know how simple it can be. Sometimes it's a matter of just seeing the something, that, the key that unlocks that person 
it's seeing something that the other people that they've been working with have not seen. Or in her case, there was one other thing that they were doing, which, which sprinters all do and they must never do. And that is she was doing long held straight knee hamstring stretches as her warm up for her sprint training. And I said to her, you know, you have to let this idea go. I said, I know all sprinters do this, but I said, it's crazy stuff. What you're doing when you do long held hamstring stretches before doing your sprint training is you're calming the neural system down. As a sprinter, you want to be ramping the neural system up. And there's only one way to do that. Start sprinting slowly, then do a few dynamic stretches, start sprinting a bit more quickly and use the activity itself as the warm up because I personally don't believe in warming up for anything. I think the activity itself is the perfect warm up, but just done at the right intensity. And I said, you save those long held stretches for after you finish training. Why? We'll talk about that later perhaps, but the key there is not only to ramp the neural system down so that you can rest and sleep and recover, but the most important reason to stretch I've never heard anyone else talk about, and that is you can use stretching as an extremely sophisticated diagnostic tool to tell you where injuries are likely to occur in the future and how to unwrap fascial knots in the body following your training activity. And this is it's hugely important for lifters. It's hugely important for athletes of any sort. The diagnostic dimension of stretching, I mean, the I'll take a step sort of sideways here. Most athletes, if you're working with an elite athlete, most athletes have sufficient range of movement for the activity they're doing. Why? They're elite. They've already got it. They have enough stride length to run quickly if they're, say, a baseball player. Yes, they, yes, they might have special, if they're a pitcher they, or a bowler, we have it in cricket here, which is not the same action at all, but they have exactly the same physical problems. Then we might need to do remedial work with the rotator cuff muscles, or we might need to improve um, slightly the, the length, say, of supraspinatus so that the bowling action or the throwing action can be done more efficiently, whatever it is. That's a technical, small technical thing. That is not the most useful use of stretching in my view. It's actually about finding out what the body needs in order to adapt and recover fully. Anyway, so my own personal journey. I, when I was, I think it was 27 or 28, going back to the middle distance running period now, and then I'll try and tie all this up because I want to hear more questions from you guys. When I was doing interval training and the interval training we were doing with this particular coach I was working with Jack Pross, his name was, he was a, pre a protege of a very famous coach called Percy Serity. And if you're in the running world, you would have heard of Percy Serity. He was Herb Elliott's coach, the first guy to break um, the four minute mile from memory. Um, and he was, he was very big on doing long, slow distance training, LSD as it was called before drugs became popular. Um, and he also was a great believer in using the sand hills for conditioning. And I'll tell you about that later if you're interested in it, because I did, we have a series of sand hills here that my coach Jack Pross used to use, and they were nearly 50 meters high. And the sand hills themselves were sitting at sand's slip angle, which is a very, very, very steep angle. And to get from the bottom to the top of that hill, look, it took minutes because every time you drove your feet into the sand, the sand would pull down on you. Can you imagine it? And so you're literally running up this slope of sand that's slipping down on top of you. Oh, brutal. I mean, brutal. These were make or break workouts. They would either lift you to the next level in your training or absolutely destroy you for two or three months. I'm not kidding. They were immensely stressful. But Jack had some very successful athletes and so we all thought that that was a very good thing to do. And certainly if you'd recovered enough, it was a good thing to do. You could absolutely feel the lift in your performance the next time you ran. And look, on that subject, I'm going to take a digression on a digression on a digression, but just while I think of it, I had a friend who was a champion bodybuilder, and I was talking to him one day about overtraining, and he just looked at me. He said, there's no such thing as overtraining, kid. I said, what the, what the fuck are you talking about? Of course there is. And we got talking about the literature on overtraining and the fight or flight response and elevated corticosteroids and all the other things that talk about, you know, that we talk about when we talk about overtraining. And he just looked at me, he said, look, 
I'm going to say it again. There is only inadequate nutrition or insufficient rest. And that was a light bulb moment for me because that is an accurate description of the whole struggle to adapt, is it not? Nothing has changed. Anyway, so, so I was doing interval training. I'll just describe the intervals too. They were brutal. They were 10, 60 second, 400 meters, this particular workout. Now, I don't know how fit you guys have been in your past, but let me tell you, it doesn't sound very spectacular when you think that what's the world record at the moment for 400 meters, I think it's about 43 seconds. So you'd think 60 second or 62 second or 63 seconds or somewhere around that 60 second mark, that can't be too hard, right? Well, people were, vomiting was a normal response, you know. It's super, super hard when you dig into your reserves that deeply the body just doesn't want to do that, to be honest with you. And anyway, so after this interval training session, and that's all that session was 10, 60 second, 400, that was the day's work. And I was trying to stretch while by, by reaching down and touching my toes, right? That was, and that was about as sophisticated as our stretching got in those days. And my fingers were just past my knees at full stretch. Now, by the way, most middle distance runners are extremely tight, as you probably know, marathon runners are even tighter. But as I've said before, they have the range of movement to do their activity. So this is not necessarily a problem. But I realized someone took a photograph of that, of me trying to touch my toes and stuck it up on the gym wall. I used to train at a very good gym with a, it was the mega, uh, well, the, the mecca, I should say, for Olympic lifters and powerlifters in Sydney at the time. It was the HK Ward Gymnasium at Sydney University. Sensational um, environment to train in. Um, it was free, believe it or not. You just had to have some connection to the university. Um, and the best lifters would train there. Um, the current or then current bronze medalist judo player would train there. It, just, it was just a sensational atmosphere. All these people trying to improve themselves. Anyway, this photograph appeared on the gym wall and underneath someone had written rubber man. And so I'm looking at this photograph of me, you know, this, the stiffest person on the planet. And, you know, talk about being stupid. We are all stupid in our own way, but this is, this is my stupidity. I thought, Hmm, I know I'm stronger than the other runners that I am training with, and I know that my aerobic capacity is excellent. My pulse rate was about 41, 42 beats a minute in those days, and very fast recovery and all the rest of it, but I still can't run really fast. Could being stiff have anything to do with it? <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, that, that's how dumb we are. And so that's, that's, <laughs> so that's when my journey, I, I went to dance classes every day before work. I was a television director in those days. I went to dance classes at a place called the Australian Academy of Ballet and I went to yoga classes as well in the heart of Sydney. And, and so over that, I think that was probably between when I was about 25 to the time when I was about, or roughly something else happened later on when I was about 28 and I've changed course again and I trained in a professional boxing gym for a couple of years, but I'll talk about that later because that's actually extremely interesting all by itself, but it's a bit... The, the direction is different to the, the direction of the whole of our conversation today so far. Anyway, what I found doing the yoga classes and doing the limbo class, as they were called, here's, here's a limbo class for you. You go into this room and someone's sitting there playing a piano. This is very old school. This is a true story. We, there's a woman whose sole job was to play the piano, right, while the kids were warming up and or limbering. Now, limbering for a dancer is they will walk into the room, they've got their leggings on, and the piano player used to make leggings too. She even made me a pair of leggings. I had a knitted pair of leggings, can you believe it? Um, and so these kids would walk in and they would slide down into front splits or side splits. This is their opening move and they'd roll around on the floor. Supposing side splits was their thing, they'd go down into side splits and then while keeping the hips on the ground, they'd then roll through into front splits and then complain about how tight they were that day. That is a dancer's life. And, and I realized watching these people and working out with these people, because I stayed with them for a couple of years, I learned two very important things. I learned that the standard limbering techniques will have almost no effect on an adult's body and certainly not a strong adult's body. And I was very strong in those days, even though I was still a runner, I was very strong. You know, back squat, when I say strong, I'm talking about um, in, at my 
top, I think I did Romanian deadlifts with 140 kilograms. That's a fair sort of weight. Uh, back squats with 140 as well. Again, for a runner, I only weighed about 60, 68 kilos, I think. So we're talking, I mean, look, it's not elite, elite level because guys, seriously, I trained in Olympic lifting gym. So guys of my weight, 70 kilos, were lifting double what I was lifting. But as a runner, I was strong, if I can put it that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I learned that, that the limbering approach to acquiring flexibility as an adult and as a tired adult was simply completely ineffective. But I persisted. And, and this is why I persisted. And I'm sure you guys can understand this because you both are very flexible for people that do strength training. And I have to compliment you both on that. You, your journey has, I want to hear about your journey too when I stop talking and I will stop talking because <laughs> it is extremely unusual for big guys to be flexible. Now I have known some, I used to know Tom Platts very well. You know, I made that film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger called The yep. Comeback. Um, I, Tom Platts, I got particularly close to him, beautiful human being, but also um, Flex Wheeler. Uh, there's been a bunch of people who have a achieved that elite level in bodybuilding and who have been extremely flexible. And if you think about the old days, and I listened to Dorian Yates, uh, I've listened to two interviews with him recently, one a Joe Rogan experience and there was another one as well. But to listen to Dorian talk about his experience, that era of bodybuilding, the 90s, which is regarded by many as the, as the pinnacle of bodybuilding, because none of those guys had those bloated guts, yet they hadn't been taking that particular cocktail of drugs. They were taking plenty of other things, but not that cocktail. Um, in the era that I know well, the Arnold era, the Frank Zane era, um, Dennis Tinarino, who never made a splash, I can't understand why, in, in person, his body was simply spectacular and extraordinarily wide shoulders too. And, and as, he was heavily built as well. Anyway. It was also the Mike Mensa era, so heavy duty was, was um, a big thing. Arthur Jones had had an immense effect. In fact, Arthur Jones was, uh, and Mike Mensa were Dorian Yates' main inspirations in terms of how he would train. And Dorian, I will say this, he deeply understood the whole need for recovery thing. He only trained three times a week, four times occasionally. But as soon as he stopped progressing, and he, with he in his interviews was very clear about what he meant about progressing or growing, as soon as that stopped, he'd back off. He wouldn't do more the way most people that we know would do. No, he backed off. And the, 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 you know his success, his formula. And also another thing too that was very interesting to hear is that he never showed off his own body when he was training. He always trained covered up. He never walked around in public with his shirt off. He never had the Venice Beach experience or any of those sorts of things. It wasn't a flash, a flash thing to him. It was, I am dedicating myself for to one thing, to winning that competition and absolutely everything else will be pressed into service of that. And because of that, and he paid, he has, he took, he said in this interview that he had every training diary from 19, 88 to 97, I think it was, 13 years worth of diaries, every training diary. That impressed me more than his physique. That is true dedication. And also he, he was ruthless about interrogating himself and asking himself what worked and what didn't work. He was the original tinkerer. And that's our approach too, because talking about going back to flexibility now, um, what we found with the kids that I was training with is all of them became flexible as children. All dancers and all gymnasts start when they're four, five, six, seven years of age, usually. Now, there are exceptions. I do know of one guy, uh, Huey West, his name is, he is an absolutely ex extraordinary and brilliant Australian dancer. He started when he was 19. But believe me, he is so far um, out of the normal range he it, it just exceptional in every way he just didn't know he was a dancer um, until he was 19 or 20. anyway so the point is this we had to discover or i had to discover how to take an adult strong very tight body i mean to, to give you an example of what i'm talking about um i am not naturally flexible in any joints in in my body they are all only in the normal range and there was no part of my body that was flexible. There was no part of my body where I felt, well, this is what it's going to feel like when I get loose. This is what, there wasn't anything. And, and I realize now, because I know Robert Schleip and Tom Meyer very well, Robert in particular, the, the gurus of fascia, um, 
on Robert's account, he said, and my name, in fact, means from the fjords in Celtic, apparently the spelling of my surname. I didn't know that until I worked with a bit of someone else. And that's something else too. You must work with as many different people as possible if you're really interested in exploring uh, your own potential, what it means to be me, what I could possibly become, because working with other people will push you. Anyway, you probably know all these things. Anyway, so I have what what Robert Schleip calls Viking fascia, very tight fascia, but extremely stable joints. That's the plus side. So I'm not hypermobile anywhere, and my joints are never at risk. Whereas some of the people that you work with, especially people who whose training regimens have made their shoulders hypermobile, they are definitely prone to injuries, as you know. So anyway, um, working on my own body, it, was, it, it wasn't until, and I'll skip over the, the boxing period now because that was two very intense years between 28 and 30. I had my 30th birthday in Japan. I decided I'd go and train in a live-in martial arts studio there. I was invited to train there and I was there for nearly four years. And that was, that was kind of shocking because I'd been a do my father was a martial arts teacher, a famous one in Australia. He had one of the biggest things in Australia at one point, and his style was called Jishukan. And his story is another whole interesting story. I won't go into that now. I was in I was in Japan, and I trained in a professional boxing gym for the two years leading up to that. And I wasn't a good boxer. Here's how this happened. It's kind of funny. I walked into this gym, and I I spoke to the owner. His name Bernie Hall. Now here I am, an ex middle distance runner at this point. I, I decided that I'd gone as far as I could in that career and still doing some Olympic lifting, although not seriously at that point. And I went into this gym and I spoke to the owner and I said, Bernie, I'm a hopeless boxer, but I'd like to train here. Will you take me on? And he just he just cracked up. He said, what do you mean you're a hopeless boxer? I said, oh, I, I'm, I'm not well coordinated. Um, I mean, I've, I've watched guys working out on the speed bag, for example. That's always a good one. To, the speed bag, the one, you know, the one that's not the speed bag where you go, not like that. The, the real speed bags, the ones that are difficult to use, are anchored floor to ceiling. Have you seen those ones? No. Yeah. Oh, well, when, when you hit them, they go off at a different tangent. They're not like a, a, a speed ball that's anchored to the ceiling where the movement is really limited. These, these can go in any direction horizontally. And so you, when you watch someone who's really good on one of those, they'll whack the bag and they'll be perfectly prepared to whack it when it's sprung back. And it's a fraction of a second. They're really fast if you make them make the bungee cords tight. Anyway, so I watched boxers at this particular gym working out and, and the then current middleweight Australian champion was one of the boxers working there. Um, and I said, look, I'm fit. Um, but I said, that's all I've got. And he said, OK, I'll take you on. He said, you realise this is a professional boxing gym, don't you? And I said, yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be your worst amateur. He said, OK, well, let's see how it goes. Now, training, boxing training in those days, and this was also a revelation because although I was aerobically very fit, Boxing training in those days considered of 15 rounds, not 12 rounds. All professional fights were 15 rounds in those days. And we would do 15 three-minute rounds with 30 seconds rest in between, and that comprised the training for that day. And every one of those rounds, whether you were shadow boxing, whether you were sparring, whether you were having the coach throw the, you were lying on your face up and having the coach throw a heavy medicine ball down onto your gut repeatedly for three minutes. Um, that, that was one round. Or yeah. all the other things that we did. I tell you, at the end of the first year, I thought I was fit coming into um, that with, with my resting pulse rate of 42 and all the rest of it. Mate, I had no idea what fitness could be like. Boxers, in my opinion, Competitive boxers are the fittest of all athletes. And I would have to say there was no mixed martial arts in those days. I would say the mixed martial artists who train like boxers, of course, these days will be equally up there. It was a, an incredible level of fitness, but it did nothing for my flexibility, of course. So here's the, here's the kicker. I went to Japan and my martial arts teachers could not understand how someone at my age wasn't perfectly flexible. And so this is the next key in the lock of flexibility. They all could do side splits. These men who were <clears throat> 40, 50 and 60 years of age, they were just like the dancers. Here's the key thing. They lived in a different body to my body. Mm -hmm. The realisation of this was profound for me. 
And I had already had those thoughts when I was working out with the young dancers because clearly they lived in a different body. Their bodies moved and were able to position and they flowed and they were graceful and all the rest of it in a way that my body wasn't. But I hadn't unlocked that. I got slightly more flexible training with them, but only very, very slightly. It was when I was in Japan and I was training, I was doing some strength training actually at a, a Kuyakusho or gym. I used to speak Japanese um, fluently. I was there for long enough and I, I studied it intensively before I went as well. And I was, I remember I was sitting opposite a leg press machine and I was, um, there's a pose in yoga called Konasana, up, Upavista Konasana, or we would call it the pancake pose, you know, legs apart, but not too far apart. You've got to be able to hold your feet. That's the, the restriction in that particular pose. And that's actually the most difficult line to bend forward on. If you can sit in side splits, and I know who's got the good side splits, you Lucas have got good side splits, I think. Um, when you're in perfect side splits, there is no additional stretch when you bend forward. You just roll over from the back of your legs to the front of your legs. Mm -hmm. No extra stretch. But when you've got your legs at about 110 degrees, all the adductors have to lengthen and all the hamstrings have to lengthen. And that's why that pose is done in yoga, holding your feet. You, It's got to be the most difficult position that you do the pancake in. So anyway, I was holding onto the machine and, and 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 this idea struck me of well i just pulled back i lifted my chest and straightened my back and i used my leg muscles to pull back against the machine and i held that for a while and i increased the force a bit and i felt the muscles that i was trying to stretch out felt them activate and i didn't really think too much about it but i found that when i relaxed and then pulled myself forward I was definitely in a new range of movement. And I thought, ooh, this is exciting. Now, of course, later on, I found that this was no new discovery at all. And it had been discovered back in 19, I think, 53 or 57, somewhere around there, at a place called the Kabat Kaiser Institute. And what that place was, was a, and they were the people that wrote the original proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation handbook, which everyone has seen, but almost no one has read. And that I'll I'll, de I'll defend that later. There was nothing in stretching in that original textbook or the second edition either. Nothing on stretching. There was one paragraph on page ninety eight that spoke about the five techniques that they had used in their clinical setting to help the cerebrally and spinally injured regain lost range of movement. And there was only a mention of five names of techniques, not even any description of how to do any of them. One was agonist antagonist, one was contract relax, one was hold relax, one was, I can't, I can't remember the other ones. <clears throat> but the point is, what this book was, it was a manual for the physical re-education. It was a practitioner manual and it was written by three nurses and a doctor. And what it was, it was teaching people who had been paralyzed partially or completely how to regain fundamental daily life movement patterns like for example rolling onto your side putting a hand down on the floor and getting up off the floor that's a typical spiral diagonal pnf movement pattern so all the things that you read about you know pnf stretching and all the rest of it they are complete fabrications they are later developments leon a guy called leon chato c-h-a-i-t-o-w wrote a book on it where he talked about that and that was really the first exploration of it from a stretching point of view. But what I did when I was in Japan is I took that, I tried out all the different, I came across a textbook in a secondhand bookstore and I tried all the different approaches as far as I could tell because there was no detail, as I said, there's nothing on how to breathe, no, nothing on how much strength to use in the contraction, nothing on, well, there was really no detail, full stop. And so I experiment, I, I was, a, a, an Iyengar yoga student when I was before I went into the professional um, boxing gym um, that was the kind of yoga that I was studying in those days so this is when I was 24 25 26 and I took his textbook called light on yoga and I applied this PNF approach as far as I understood it at least anyway to every one of the major fundamental yoga poses and I created that system practicing that on myself because I didn't do anything in Japan at night time. I didn't go out and I wasn't into drinking. Um, 
I was very interested in Miles Davis music and I, uh, and so I had a stereo of Miles playing and I would basically siege that book for a, an hour or two every night. Now I know now that that's not the best way to do it and that, that's a whole other story too, how we found out what the ideal frequency is, but basically I'm a tinker. I like to know how things work and my own body wasn't working the way I wanted it to work. I wanted to have some of that grace and freedom of movement that the dancers and the martial artists had and I didn't have that. So once I had this initial breakthrough, I realized that the missing link for an adult in terms of becoming flexible was actually about getting stronger. Now, I know you two already have been singing the song to your, your athletes, and that's fantastic. The, the big difference, I think, in getting stronger using the contract relax method is, and unlike any other kind of stretching work, is it actually increases your strength at the end of the range of movement. Now, normal strength training, as you know, we, we can talk, there, there's only one exercise that develops strength at the end of the range of movement in the strength training lexicon, and that is calf raises. If you're using a machine to do calf raises, you will be lifting yourself out of the fully stretched bottom position, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true for the bench press, that's not true for the squat, it's not true for the deadlift, and all of the other big exercises, that's not true for. What you do is you develop strength in the middle part of the range of movement and towards the contracted end. And normally not the fully contracted end either because body parts get in the way. So the bottom position of the squat, I remember as an Olympic lifter, my coach had us doing what he called one and a half. So I'm sure you're familiar with this. You put a weight on your back, you drop down into the bottom position, you pause there, you reset yourself, you lift yourself up to the parallel position, you go back down again to the bottom position and then you stand all the way up. They're actually my favorite squats because they're a massive glute developer, as you know, they really, really work well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, compressing things in a few years now, uh, by the time I came back from Japan, I had completely changed my flexibility. I was able to put myself into full Lotus. I've got photographs of me um, doing a full back bend, which is as, as good a back bend as I've seen anyone do, apart from contortionists, of course. I was never a contortionist, but all of those normal things like pancake side splits, where you've probably seen my book, uh, Stretching and Flexibility, I'm in decent side splits on blocks in that book. That took me, once I got back to Australia, that, that particular range of movement took me just six months to get once I started training for that specifically. Um, but then I didn't pursue it after that. And so my side, I'm working on side splits again at the moment, by the way, because I've decided I'm going to be a 70 year old man who can do good side splits. And so that's, that's my little goal at the moment. And I'm still doing my strength training too. Um, chin ups are my favorite upper body strength exercise um, and ring, ring push ups and um, pseudo plant push ups, those kinds of things. Uh, and for strength training for my legs, I, I, you might have seen a YouTube clip I put up when I was in Queensland a few months ago, working on a boat. I've got an, a kind of interesting looking assisted single leg squat where you, you use, I use the edge of a, um, a bench where the, basically the seat angle is not horizontal, but it's actually tilted down towards the back of a bench, the way benches are normally organized. <clears throat> and that reduces the angle re flexibility requirement of the single leg squat a little bit. And what I do is I use a single toe from the other foot to hook onto the side of that bench and I do single leg squats like that. Mm. And so once I've done, I got up to 30 um, on one leg and then you swap over and do the other leg. And the next session you start with the leg that you um, finish with so that over time, both legs get equally strong. And I found this absolute, it, it, well, the use of the, of the little, of the, of the, so the big toe of the other foot it actually decreases the balance requirement of the single leg squat. And as you know, that's the, the biggest component of it and why, why so many guys that we know that can say squat 140 in the gym and they, only, they might weigh 80 kilos or something, but they can't do a single leg squat to save their lives. They haven't got the range of movement, they haven't got the balance and they haven't got the coordination to do that. But we think those kind of body weight type movements are profoundly important and that's really where when you're taking a new student, in my opinion, at least anyway, that's where one's strength training should start. Anyway, look, I've talked about 10 million different things. That's enough. That's enough about my background. 
um, it's been an interesting one and, and, and fortunately for me it's still continuing and it's still changing too as your body ages it's, a, a, it's just the whole thing is a fascinating journey if you're paying attention to it because the day that you're in now will never come back again and each, each day as you know well all athletes know this every day your body is actually different subtly and in the flexibility world that is it's always the case it's always changing and if you don't pay attention you're going to get hurt right so anyway that's that's enough about me. You remember that famous Bette Midler gag? I think I can't remember the film, but she talks in a monologue like I just had for about 20 minutes. She said, well, that's, that's enough about me. What do you think about me? That <laughs> is so funny. So I'm, yeah. going to stop, I'm going to stop talking now. Please ask me specific questions. Well, um, it would be good to just kind of go into with the, like what you had just talked about with your story. Like your story really became about now let's 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 make an adult flexible like what is it that adults like you came to realize like okay people you're going to specialists or areas where people were flexible they were flexible when they were younger mm -hmm. and that's that's like what jeff and i deal with this on a daily basis as i'm sure you've been dealing with it for as long as you've been working in flexibility as a specialization is that idea that no i'm, I'm just not flexible um or I've never been flexible and now I'm too old to get flexible, right? So, um, I mean, if you could give some perspectives on like, sure. you know, you came to that realization and then what was it that was like, this is what adults need to do. You know? Okay, um, I, and I can be relatively brief about this and look, if I, if I get to, I have the capacity to think about probably six or eight or 10 things at the same time, but still keep the, the, the thread of a conversation in mind. So if I do get too sidetracked, Please just pull me back. It's no problem. I won't forget where I am in the in the, the thread. If you have a look at the back cover of stretching and flexibility, there is a guy there with a massive beard on the top row. In that image, in that photograph, he is 67 years of age. That's exactly my age now. And he has perfect front splits. And when I say perfect front splits, he has square hips. And even in a dancing gym, you don't see that very often. You never see it in a gymnastics gym. In fact, I'll tell you a story. We were doing, Emmett mentioned too, that we have the, the world best hip flexor stretchers. Well, that was very generous. Emmett is a close friend of mine. I love that guy to death because he is exactly the same mentally as I am. He is constantly tinkering, not through a sense of dissatisfaction, the opposite. He, it's exciting to him. Um, and he has rediscovered many things that we discovered ourselves back in the old days and simply forgot about. And he has rediscovered those things and he's supercharged them. His end range closing techniques, and I think he's even changed the name of that now, but for developing um, VAP and uh, all those other things that require real compression strength as well as flexibility, he really knows, he knows in fact as far as i can tell all there is to know about that and he refound that by himself and so anyone that discovers things by themselves and is not just parroting what their teachers taught them anyone who has that approach is is aces by me i wanted i want to be close to people like that i want to involve people like that in my own personal life anyway uh for this guy 67 years of age the one with the beard he was a middle, he was a middle distance runner, a very very, he a very a master's grade runner when I first met him, and he had had he had an ankle spur, uh, the end of his shin bone where it articulates. Well, I think it's the navicular. I'm, I could be wrong on that, but whatever the whatever the tibia sits on, anyway, that bone there. He had a a bone spur on this part of the surface of the tibia, and it used to lock his ankle ankle up when he was running. And so he came into, into our gym space um, and I noticed it was something a bit odd. He was, he was um, walking on the balls of his feet all the time. And he came in and, and talked about this bone spur and he said, look, I, I'm not into this flexibility stuff myself, but my wife has been attending your classes for years. And he said, I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a bit of a skeptic. Um, so what do you think you can do for me? I've got a bone spur. And he brought out these x-rays and showed me what the bone spur was. And I said, well, let's look at your range of movement in the ankle joint first. And then he just said to me, you're looking at it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this is full stretch for me. And his heels weren't actually on the ground. 
And I said to him, what's the story there? And he said, well, I'm a tow runner. He was so proud of this. He was a tow runner back in the days before tow running had been discovered. And when I looked at his calf muscles, and I'm, again, I'm not making this up. You couldn't make this stuff up. His calf muscles were a roadmap. It's like looking at a roadmap of the USA, similar kind of shape too. He had veins as thick as my little fingers all over gastrocnemius and over soleus as well. And he, he, when I watched him run, he had an amazingly elastic run. His heels never touched the ground. And he was using stored elastic energy from his Achilles tendons to do all of his running. So I said to him, look, this is just a, perhaps a wild idea, but why don't we try to improve your ankle range of movement and see what happens to the bone spur? Because he'd been to see two specialists, both had said he needs an operation. So anyway, this guy, Eldon, his name is, triple A personality. Um, I showed him a seated calf raise, you know, that exercise where you, um, you lift on a handle in a, in a, on a machine in a gym and you put a, uh, a padded thing over your knees and you put the balls of your feet on a plate and you let the weight down and then you basically do heel raises. So it's, it's solely exercise, you know, the, you know the machine I'm talking about. Well, I'm not exaggerating, within six weeks, he was lifting the full stack in the gym and he had doubled it. I'm not making this up. I know it sounds impossible, but he had doubled his range of movement in his calf muscle. And two months now, or maybe three months after the initial conversation, he said, well, he came back and said, saw me in the gym. He said, well, it worked. I said, what do you mean it worked? Because I had heard nothing from him in the intervening period. Nothing. I wasn't coaching him. I wasn't working with him. Nothing. I let him loose with this one exercise and that was it. He said, I've just had that ankle x-ray and the bone spur has gone. So you've heard of this concept, resorption, S-O-R-P-T-I-N. That's what the right stress can do. And that's also true for extruded disc material as well. Talking about lumbar spine and cervical spine problems. The extruding material can be resorbed by the body if the body is stimulated the right way. And so what Eldon had done, he had literally forced that range of movement back into his ankle and the body just sucked that bone material back into its body. There wasn't a floater there, there wasn't like an avulsion fracture, there wasn't a piece of bone floating around or anything like that. It had completely been absorbed or reabsorbed by the body. And this experience, he had no idea that it was possible to change the body like this. And frankly, I didn't either because it's an extreme case. He became one of our students and the guy who's sitting in full front splits on the back of that book, that was him seven years after joining the classes. And this guy, when he joined the classes, was like me when uh, I was in the rubber man phase. He could not reach his fingers past his toes. And he totally transformed his body in seven years. And so you asked me the secret for adults becoming flexible. And this is where the idea, or partly came from at least anyway, and also through my own experiences with getting front splits and side splits, is men, this is not true for women, by the way, and so we do need to talk about um, sex differences at some point. Men, if they want to achieve their maximum flexibility, will need to be, if we're talking hip flexibility now, they will need to be able to support themselves with their adductors and or their hamstrings and hip flexors, if you're talking about side splits and front splits, they will need to be able to hold up their entire body's weight for at least 15 seconds with those muscles. And the way I do it, I balance on fingertips, just one, one finger, so I'm not really using my whole weight, but it's close to it. I started out with fingers, all fingers and, and thumb, and then basically reduced them. And the, you get strong really quickly, as you know, uh, in that range of movement. Once you're sufficiently strong, you'll have this experience, and I know you both have had this experience yourself, you'll have the experience one day where you're holding yourself up at the extreme of the range of movement. And then when you do the, the, the crucial stopping of the contraction, not moving, taking a breath in, letting your tummy go soft as you breathe out, and then re-stretching on the second breath out, you will have the experience of finding one day, oh, that resistance, that limitation, that barrier that's normally there, it is not there anymore. 
And you, if you're sensible about it, you'll carefully lower yourself to the new position. And guess what? The barrier is there. It's just further on in the range of movement. That's all. And you repeat that over time. And what your colleagues will say is, fuck, you're flexible. What, what have you been doing? It won't feel any different at the end of the range of movement. Am I right? Not until that range of movement has been deeply embodied by you. And in my case, it was years. So my fascia is so tight, I would work, 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 get the release, get the new range of movement, stay in the end position. You've got to stay in the end position for at least a few minutes too if you want that fascia to remodel. Um, but I don't have that kind of relaxed flexibility that my wife has, for example, Olivia, who became flexible as a gymnast and as a child. She has excellent side splits, perfect pancake cold. We sh she released that thing recently where she did full back bend, side splits, front splits, um, perfect pancake cold. We, we don't bullshit in the stuff that we do. That was in, done in a very cold room. First thing in the morning, I was shooting her, I think about nine o'clock in the morning. She'd only had a coffee, so hadn't even woken up hardly. That kind of flexibility we call embodied flexibility. And I think both of you are, are sneaking up on that. If you don't actually already have it, you're very close to having it in your hip movements. Once you've got that, both of you, you'll have it for life. That's, that's a promise. You won't even need to do it very often. Once every two or three weeks will be enough. <laughs>